Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the event. So we have the Northwestern University Robotics Club with us today. They're a group of around 40 undergraduate students interested in applying skills learned through coursework to fun problems. The team build, builds combat robots to compete in exciting national competitions, precision robots to play lacrosse, underwater, remotely operated vehicles, and more. Club members have a wide range of interests and majors, including mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, and engineering data science, and more. So we'll ask them a few questions and then open it up to the audience to ask questions. And if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or put it in the chat. All right, so I'll take it away. Um, so hey there, so my name is Jackson. I'm the outreach lead for Northwestern Robotics. Um, I'm a sophomore. Uh, studying computer engineering at Northwestern. Um, if you guys want to just like go around and like introduce yourselves. I'm Sam Petralia. I'm a senior studying mechanical engineering. Uh, I'm one of the co-presidents of any robotics club. I also work a lot of lacrosse and combat robotics teams as well. Yeah. I'm Cecilia. I'm a senior studying computer science and math. Um, I also working on a lacrosse robot uh, with Sam. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Garrett. I'm a junior mechanical engineer um, and I work on the combat robots and the cross. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm a junior studying biomedical engineering and I'm one of the leads of underwater robotics. Cool, so just to kind of go over some of the stuff that was said in the bio initially, we're all undergrad students in Northwestern. Um, we do this club sort of as an extracurricular in addition to the stuff we learned in the class. So, you know, it allows us to apply some of the skills that we learned from class to uh, you know, fun problems, make it, middle, make it a little more real. Um, and we also pick up some other skills along the way, such as machining, you know, working with CAD and a few other skills that we wouldn't or ordinarily get um, through coursework. So, um, you know, we have in case you don't you know, know what all the engineering majors are, if you're coming to this event, you've probably seen a lot of these terms, but people on our team um, are from you know, almost all areas of the engineering school, you know, from biomedical engineering to computer engineering, computer science, industrial engineering, you know, mechanical engineering. You know, um, robotics is great because it allows you to sort of integrate talents from all over. Um, so you know, it's pretty cool. So the first thing we're sort of going to talk about is we have a number of projects that we kind of um, work on. So we'll go into all of them later. But um, you know, one of our biggest ones right now, at least, is the combat robotics project. So with this, we basically build robots to compete at national events. Um, Jared, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard of BattleBots, um, which is like a subgenre of combat robots. Um, so BattleBots are 250 pound combat robots. We build three and 30 pound combat robots. Um, and we build the smaller ones because they're a lot safer and a lot cheaper than the 250 pound robots. Um, so it's a lot more accessible for us uh, and we can build more of them. Um, so we use a lot of our designing, uh, engineering design to build um, these different type of robots, um, make sure they can survive taking a couple of hits. There's a lot of different skills that go into them, um, especially CAD machining. Um, there's very little programming, to be honest, on these. Um, we use like RC controllers, um, but there, there is a little bit of programming that um, go into them. Um, so here is just sort of an example um, of what our design process sort of looks like. So we'll come up with an idea of what we want to build, um, and then we'll work in our CAD software of choice. Um, we actually, in our combat robotics, we have several different um, groups that use several different CAD programs, um, but we'll design it in the CAD program. And so on the left, or I think it should be left for you guys, you can see um, the CAD version of our robot Jack. And then on the right is the actual physical version that we took to competition. Um, and Jack is a, what's called a lifter. Um, so the goal of Jack is to um, get under your opponent and flip them over. Um, and yeah, so that's Jack. Um, and now I believe we have a couple of videos from our competition um, in Connecticut that we attended in the fall. Um, so this one, or both of the videos. Oh. Ben. Um, drum spinner. Yeah. Okay. So Juan is a drum spinner. So it just takes a like a big cylinder of metal and spins it very fast. Um, and uses that kinetic energy to defeat the opponent. Um, it's the silver boxy one that just. So you can see we um, 
took out our opponent pretty well in this match. Um, their battery and all their inner guts are sort of uh, spewing across, across the arena. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of an example of what um, a good match for us looks like. Uh, we, we were pretty successful in um, dismantling the robot. There's another big hit here in about 10 seconds or so, um, which I'll let play out, maybe. Um, but basically, you lose by not being able to move anymore. So they could still move barely, um, so they haven't technically lost yet, um, but that will change momentarily. This so, is from uh, a competition in Norwalk, Connecticut that we all traveled to. So uh, we all piled in like two vans and drove 12 hours to go compete here. So it was a really fun weekend. That's a lot of fun when stuff like that happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it pays off after two months of engineering work. So yeah. Yeah, we mostly compete against um, sort of amateur people. And then also there's a few colleges that also have teams. So it's a good group of people. There's, yeah, there's also people from actual, like the TV show BattleBots that build small robots to compete as well. So here we, they can't move, so we, we won the match. Um, but then in our, in our next match here, um, this is the second match for Juan. Went to Motorama and defeated Megatron. This, is, this yeah. did not go as well. This is not a great match for us. Um, uh, <laughs> it was a one hit KO. We thought we should have an example of, you know, the good and the bad, because let's be real, both things happen um, when you're designing stuff. Yeah. So, you know, that's sort of what we're trying to avoid happen in the future. Um, but, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, well, there's a whole bunch of different skills that go into um, all robotics, of course, but especially um, combat robotics, just like basic engineering, lots of CAD work and lots of machining. All right, so that'll take us to, um, I believe, you, Rob. Um, yeah, so you, Rob, uh, a long way is underwater remotely operated vehicle, but you're for short. Uh, what we do is we design and build a robot and accessory tools or props to help um, compete at regional and national events. The main one we're going for this year is Mate ROV competition, which is uh, more targeted toward uh, tasks that more or less relate to real life marine underwater um, like activity. Uh, UROV is broken up into three sub teams, mechanical, electrical, and software. I'm currently the mechanical lead, um, but you can join whichever. And a lot of different skills are used. CAD is one of them. I've used Onshape, but I've also used uh, SolidWorks. I know someone who used Fusion 360. Um, electrical, they deal with like drive stations, soldering, putting together the wiring components together. And <laughs> software, uh, this year, it's actually, we have a task that is more software heavy, which is identifying um, like dead fish, but it's dead fish because it's only a task. And uh, on the sides, you can see the process of designing things. On top is a CAD version of the claw that we're going to use for a task. And on the bottom is a 3D printed version. On the right is the PixHawk, which is how we communicate with the motors, the camera. Um, and the long tether you see in the video is obviously how we get the information. So in this video, we were actually intending to have a little piece of PVC that's in the pool. You can kind of see it. Um, next to the black uh, mark at the bottom of the pool, that was supposed to be attached to string. The string snapped when we threw it in. So luckily, it landed how it was supposed to. And in this, we have someone who is actually controlling the URAV while everybody else is shouting directions. In the actual competition, we're not allowed to shout directions, and we're going to have to only use the camera itself. It's a little weird to see here, but we actually hooked it first try, and thankfully we got it out and didn't have to make the people at the pool angry that we lost a prop in the pool. And this, it, there was truly feelings of victory here. And I think if, how much of the video is left? Because I think at the end, like we do physically see, oh, it's almost done. But we do end up getting the PVC out, thankfully. And then we went and did it a second time. 
but this time actually attaching it. Uh, we did it. So next up um, is lacrosse. Do you want to take that away? Yeah. So lacrosse is like kind of a, a big thing at Northwestern women's lacrosse team is, was like one of the greatest sports dynasties in the 2000s. Uh, I think we had like 10 national championships in a row or something. And so from that sprouted the idea that we could help them train and practice by building a robot that acts as a goalie. So when they shoot on it, the robot like tries to stop the ball. And so this is um, very much a kind of a complicated design problem, but we use two cameras, kind of like how a, a normal lacrosse goalie that's a human uses their two eyes to track a ball as it's coming, identify where it is, where it's gonna like cross the plane of the goal and then try and move some version of a lacrosse goalie stick to, to catch it. Um, so yeah, like we kind of have a design, if you've ever seen like a 3D printer that moves around an extruder to print hot plastic onto a print bed and create something, it kind of does the same thing. We're moving around in two dimensions to try and catch the ball. And this all happens very quickly. So we're, we're working in time scales of like milliseconds to try and move things uh, around pretty quickly. Um, yeah, I think Cecilia, you want to yeah, talk I can speak, about the software? Yeah, I can speak more on the software. So there's, uh, in terms of the actually detecting and tracking the ball, we use a lot of machine learning and computer vision to do that aspect. Um, yeah, a lot of the big tech jargon that you see around. <laughs> um, but it, it's pretty cool. And uh, that's definitely the main uh, thing that we're working on software wise. Some other things we are also doing, we're also um, working on actually controlling the motors. Um, that's one big task on the software we need to do. And also later on, we are also working on trying to make some sort of interface that can e that the, the lacrosse team can easily use to control the robot. Um, yeah, that pretty much covers it for the software. So this is sort of a image of a mock-up of what the design's gonna look like. Yeah, so that's like the design in CAD. And then on the right is us using one of the mills in the, the school shop here to start making parts for it. Um, yeah, we, we've been machining for probably like 20 hours total yet, and we're maybe like a quarter of the way through. So it's like <laughs> a very a very involved process. Um, lots of time goes into trying to make something. So it's, it's just very large. So, you know, it takes a lot of time to, to build something like that. Yeah, for scale, the thing on the left is probably like six foot tall by like 10 feet. So it's, it's yeah. very large. Yeah, well, the orange lacrosse goal in the back there is six feet by six feet. So yeah, it's a little bit bigger than that. So we can reach all points in lacrosse goal to like catch the ball and do cool stuff. So yeah. Yeah, also, I don't know if you guys have like seen the YouTube channel like Stuff Made Here, but he made a video to play basketball that uses a pretty similar technology. I think we started working on this before that video came out, funnily enough. <laughs> Several years. Several years that. before. Um, but, you know. Real engineering is not as easy as the YouTube makes it seem. So, <laughs> well, also, that yeah. guy's crazy cool. Yeah, yeah, that too. But you know, so that's you know another example of like something that we're working on. Um, yeah, we also have some other projects. Um, we have a group that's working on a foosball table, so it'll basically use a camera and you know computer vision and stuff to actually turn you know knobs to play foosball against you. Uh, foosball is pretty popular with that team, so. We wanted to play against a robot. Um, there's MRDC, which is basically it's like a competition. If you've ever done like Vex, FTC, first robotics, it's a similar idea to that, just on you know a much higher level. Um, so competitions like that, and then we also have a few other uh, projects. Um, so Vex. So I think I saw we had a, I think one question. Um, Are we moving to Q and A now? I think that's the end of the presentation, right? Oh yeah, takeaways, but um, yeah, I guess we just do Q and A. Yeah, I could uh, answer the question since it was about combat robotics. Um, so the competition we went to um, this last fall was like one of the first competitions a lot of our robots had competed in. Um, so they were not great, and we're sort of doing like a complete redesign on a lot of them. Um, but moving forward, we are working on improving uh, repairability. Um, one of the main things that we are one of the things we try to do that is to reduce the number of parts we have um, so we could like machine extras as well as um, creating parts that are mirror images of each other so like say on the robot we have two parts but they're identical they're just like flipped so then you could just make one replacement part um, for both of those two parts um, so yeah repairability is a concern um, 
for when we're moving forward. We also have to be sort of careful to like hit the medium point between like everything costs money, right? Um, yeah. So we have to make sure that the robot doesn't break so easily that, you know, super expensive to repair, but, you know, building stuff that is super resilient is also a lot more expensive and heavy and weight's a big concern for us. So we sort of have to strike a middle ground of, you know, those two factors. Uh, I don't know if you had like a panel of questions for the next part or if you guys uh, want to. Yeah. Sure. Can you guys tell us about a technical challenge that you faced on your project and how you were able to overcome it? Sure, I can talk about that. So uh, for the lacrosse robot, the design you actually saw a few slides ago is probably the third or fourth iteration of like a full scale mechanical prototype. Um, one of the hardest things to do, um, especially in linear mo motion, as that kind of uses to do linear motion over long spans, because as you go longer and longer, you increase the chances of like having two things bind up. And the farther apart you put your two kind of points of motion along there, you kind of see it in the design um, where you have like a central bar that moves along, is that if you apply a force on one end, you would have a very large lever arm, which puts a large torque on the, on the bearing up top. So the farther apart you make those things, the harder it is to keep it from binding. Um, so in the sense where, like in other designs, we had like maybe several um, shafts along the side or axes for linear motion to help reduce that, but then you increase your weight by a lot uh, in doing that. And so like when we're trying to catch a lacrosse ball that's moving up to 80 miles an hour, uh, we have to move the end effector or the lacrosse ball stick really quickly. And Newton's second law of motion deal tells us that force equals mass times acceleration. <laughs> So if we have, if we can output the same force from our motors or same torque, and then we need a certain acceleration, we have to bring mass down. So reducing weight is often a very big technical challenge in, in a lot of different projects. Um, because the, the lighter you can make something, the cheaper motor you can use to drive it quickly. I said we also have some other questions. Um, Do you want to look, look Proctor, like what's going on? Like, yeah. yeah, I can, I guess I can answer some of the questions in the chat we kind of keep moving on to the panel that's okay um what would the usual budget be for these kind of robots so it really, really depends um you know for the combat robots that we build they like a thousand to fifteen hundred for our 30 pound robots yeah so it's not cheap but it's a lot more accessible than the big ones you see on battle bots which are like in the 60 four, grand 60 40 60, yeah. 40 60 grand yeah so At they're least. pretty expensive um you know we're lucky enough to have um, support from the university, from various grants. Um, we're getting some corporate sponsors, so we get funding that way. But something that is super important in engineering and not talked about as much is, you know, funding. Um, there's a lot of cool projects that you'll want to make at some point in your life. So having the skills to sort of go out and get the funds to actually build them um, is super important. So, you know, building soft skills like grant proposals and how to like pitch ideas and stuff is a super important thing. Um, that I think kind of gets dropped a lot of the time when people aren't kind of giving you advice about like engineering and stuff. Um, you know, all the math and stuff is pretty cool. Same with CAD and whatnot, but almost equally important is, you know, getting money. So, <laughs> right. Um, what are the most important skills to have in order to design and build these robots? Uh, I'd say maybe not quite a skill, but a willingness to fail is one of the most important things, um, not being afraid to try something new and have it mess up. I think uh, even the lacrosse robot, kind of how I talked about where we had three different designs, like I was too afraid to like just go forth and build one. And so I was just like, no, this isn't gonna work. This isn't gonna work. And it delayed the project along with, you know, the pandemic, but it delayed the project quite a bit. And finally we were just like, you know, let's just build something and see how it works because you can learn something from that and learn from failure much more than learning from just like shapes on a screen in that kind of sense. That's it. Uh, what parameters do you work around and what challenges do these cause? Um, right, so, you know, biggest design parameter in almost all of our tasks is weight. Yeah, weight is a big one, especially like combat robots, The um, there's a hard limit on weight. So like each um, category of robot, like the 30 pound robots, you can't weigh more than 30 pounds. So that's a big uh, design parameter. Money, of course, it's a big one. Um, machinability and like time, because um, there's a lot of designs that like would work and like we could theoretically make, but it would take like a hundred hours in the shop to do them. 
um, and we're students. This isn't like our full time job. So um, like being able to make it quickly is a big um, parameter. You guys have a thing? Um... So uh, regarding underwater robotics, as the first thing that I think to start in learning about the learning process, I know I started with the mechanical side of things and I first learned on shape, but um, like I, that was at a robotics club thing, but I then went on my own, found a really great YouTube channel that actually taught me more about the SOLIDWORKS. Um, regarding the electronics kind of stuff, I also, I've only recently started learning about like electronics in classes, but I think that one of the, honestly, one of the best places to start learning about CAD or electronics related stuff or software stuff is YouTube. There's a bunch of really good resources there. And frankly, it's more fun to watch YouTube video than like Google something and then have to read text to do it. I, I mean, I can suggest uh, personally a YouTube channel that I use to learn SOLIDWORKS if you want. Um, I'll just like, here, here's the SOLIDWORKS thing that I used. And it was a pretty good baseline, but one of the best ways to learn is to just, you know, keep practicing and find people who are also interested so you can build off of each other. Um, I see there's a question about someone who did FRC and is wondering about MRDC. So um, actually, funnily enough, MRDC <laughs> is now the broad term for all of our uh, team competitions that don't involve, um, or that sort of involve various games and competitions. Um, so right now they're working on a uh, amp. Uh, I, can, I can speak to this, yeah. I'm also on MRDC. So um, right now we're, we kind of pivoted away from the actual MRDC competition for the school year. Uh, so we're, we're focusing on this challenge called Micro Mouse, which is just building a, a small robot that can autonomous, autonomously navigate a random maze. Like, so you don't know what the configuration of the maze is beforehand, um, which is a pretty cool programming challenge in my uh, opinion. Uh, to more directly answer your question, I did do actually see, actually see MRDC in my first year here, um, I would say it's actually incredibly similar to FRC because um, MRDC usually involves some sort of ball collecting mechanism and scoring balls, um, which is pretty similar to first competitions, I think. Um, I think um, also kind of the, the level of like um, the technical difficulty is uh, definitely higher just because like, um, I think in college, we're all a little more knowledgeable about how to build a robot now. Um, there's also a lot of variety of different robots because I remember, I think in first you all can only build like a land-based robot. Um, there's a lot of people who try to build drones, flying robots for MRDC uh, to do the challenges. So overall, it's actually very similar, uh, just some, some smaller minor differences, yeah. And you don't have to find like a direct allegory to FRC to be able to like apply those skills to other robots, robotics, or just like uh, engineering in general. Um, like the skills you learn in FRC are really good for just like any engineering really in general. So yeah. FRC is great. Yeah. Uh, also, I know there was a question we missed that asked how many competitions we go to in a year. Um, combat robotics is going to go to like three or four every year. Um, MRDC, I believe, has just one every year. And then I think UROV is going to either one or two. So that's that's about how many yeah, you have. So it's pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, could we hear about the uh, any design parameters uh, for the UROV as well? Oh, OK. So design parameters for the UROV is uh, typically um, dependent on the tasks themselves or the competition for that year. So this year, there's actually technically no size constraint. Like usually they want to give dimensions. Technically there's no size constraint, but one of the things we do have to think about is reading all the tasks and figure out what would be the most effective size, like to balance mobility or how much weight it's going to need to lift. 
Um, another thing that we definitely have to consider is what kind of accessories that we want to add onto the robot. So our current robot has uh, two panels uh, near the base with holes in them. So if we need to make a claw or we need to make a hook or something else, um, it can be easily attached and detached. Um, I know that one of the things that we actually do have to make sure is that the robot is light enough. There, there are weight constraints, but there's no dimension constraints, so they, actually, they can be quite um, interconnected. Um, other, oh, I guess one of the major design constraints also is making sure that the robot is balanced correctly because um, actually what you saw in the video before was a robot that was, that every time it had to move forward, it would tilt downward, which is unideal. So we're actually trying to rebuild the frame so we can accommodate um, at least one other motor to help us with tilt. Um, I know you guys touched on this a little bit, but could you elaborate more on the overlap between the skills you learn in robotics in your classes and some of the stuff you have to learn your own for, on your own for robotics? Yeah, um, for sure. So, you know, I'm a sophomore, so I don't have as much firsthand experience as like some other people, but a lot of the stuff you learn in class is super theoretical. You know, it's equations, stuff on paper, you know, uh, various levels of like kinematic stuff. But you never really, outside of like labs, where it's very like one direct path, you never really get to actually design stuff with those skills. Um, so for example, you know, you learn about, I think Sam worked on like force analysis for the cross robot, which is the skill that he picked up in class. Um, so I think you're able to sort of apply that in some regard. Um, yeah, I think um, there's, there's a decent amount of overlap. It, like Jackson said, it's a lot of, application. I mean, um, thinking mechanically, like there's a couple of big classes that teach you about like forces and displacements and like stretching of mechanical parts, metal parts in like a design like this. And so like taking those kind of first principles um, where you have very strict boundary condi conditions in your class, like word problems that tell you exactly every, the value of every parameter, every variable, and you just like plug and chug and solve for the last one. Now you're like have eight different variables that you can all change on your own. And so figuring out how those are interconnected, but you learn kind of those relationships in class, but now you have much more complete control over everything in terms of like a full design experience. Uh, I don't know about software. Yeah, I can speak on the software. So uh, like as Jackson kind of said earlier, a lot of the things you learn in class is very theoretical. Um, so I, I get, I've taken my machine learning computer vision classes, but it, it's very theory based, um, very focused on like the equations and understanding the algorithms. You do some coding to actually implement them, but you never really uh, use uh, the code you write to actually uh, solve an actual problem. So I, I think what's really nice about this club is that you can actually take those skill, theoretical skills you learn in class and apply them to um, an actual challenge. Um, so. I mean, I can add in a small detail about, um, so in class, you learn formulas, you have practice problems, um, but you kind of apply more the logic to real life. So I know I, I took physics and one of the things that came up, or I took fluid mechanics and one of the things that came up was buoyancy. And obviously that's one thing that we have to consider in the UROF. So um, we're trying to figure out how much the robot is going to weigh with all its parts and how much rotation we're going to need because we want to try to keep the robot as neutral as possible um, so, be, so we don't have to battle it trying to float or it trying to sink while we're trying to pilot straight. Um, uh, I guess I'll, I'll go on to answer the question in chat. No, there isn't a limit to how many people can participate in any of the clubs and there's also no limit in like what you're majoring in. You can be, uh, I don't know, you could be an English major if you wanted and join robotics. I'm biomedical engineering and I'm in robotics, so it's very heavy mechanical. Um, and you can join any year. There's a lot of people who I think 
they'll realize that for at least for Northwestern's robotics club, the way to join is to just show up, show up, get involved. And what you put in is what you get out of it. If you want to be more involved, you're going to get a more thorough experience, more fun experience with working with everyone and going through the things. Yeah, also just to sort of talk about that in like a broader sense, um, you know, it's not just robotics club, like when you get to college, you know, there are, you know, a lot of clubs where there's really no limit to the number of people that can participate. So the most important thing is just getting out there, and, you know, getting involved. Um, so that's sort of an important takeaway, I think, to sort of remember as you sort of enter college and, you know, sort of close to some extent. So you just have to sort of just get out there, just go for it, you know, start building stuff, it'll work out. Yeah, kind of staying on that topic, how did you decide that you wanted to study engineering uh, in college and how did you choose your major specifically? To me? Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I guess we can all answer this. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, a good question for everyone to answer. Um, but um, ever since I was young, I've liked to sort of just like um, see how things work. Um, I always just take stuff apart when I was little. Um, and then I was I was involved with robotics through middle school and high school. Um, so I always knew I wanted to do engineering. I wasn't really sure exactly what sort of engineering I wanted to go into. Um, I chose mechanical engineering because it's a really broad um, field. You could go into um, fluid dynamics or you could do um, like automotive stuff. You could go anywhere. Anyone will hire a mechanical engineer well, pretty much. Um, so that's why I, I didn't was 100% sure what I wanted to do. So I picked mechanical and I, I've also doing a robotics concentration. Um, so that's something I've sort of focused in on as I've been here in college. Um, but yeah, that's how I decided. Yeah, um, I was actually biomedical engineering when I came in. Um, I had sort of worked at a medical engineering lab um, before and I thought that was pretty cool. But I sort of realized throughout the course of freshman year that I was way more interested in computer science and sort of electrical stuff. Um, so I switched to computer engineering, which is sort of like right in the middle of computer science and electrical engineering. Um, so I really liked it. Um, you know, I also did robotics in high school. I did FTC, uh, but I sort of always liked, you know, programming and robotics and stuff as a kid. So it just sort of seems like a logical kind of next step for me. Yeah, I have a bit of a different experience. So like in middle school and high school, I had very little engineering experience and by very little, I mean, not at all. Uh, I come from like a small high school in the, in the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin. And so most of our classes were, we just had like a few science classes and a math class. And I enjoyed those topics and I wanted to pursue those further in college. So I actually also came in as biomedical engineering because I thought, you know, I didn't want to be like a straight physics or chemistry major. I wanted to do some kind of engineering and like, Biomedical would let me take some of the biology and chem classes I enjoyed in high school. Um, but then actually through robotics, club, I, I like went to the first meetings, like did our fall quarter workshop, learning more and more. And like I found that I was enjoying that a lot. And the things I were in, was enjoying were like much more geared towards mechanical engineering. Um, even talking with like people in the club, um, they were like, oh yeah, like a lot of this stuff is much more mechanical engineering than like biomedical. And so I switched freshman year also. I think that's like kind of a common path. I think a lot of people do switch majors um, their their first year, especially after like speaking with other people, taking their first round of classes. It's kind of hard because you don't see any major specific classes until you know later in college. So I think like you know clubs where you're actually doing things maybe a little bit ahead of the curve is where you can kind of get a greater insight on on what you want to do. So that's kind of how it happened for me. Yeah, for me, I also did first robotics and I throughout high school, and I also did. F um, Lego robotics in middle school. So I, I kind of always liked engineering and I, through doing robotics, I realized I really enjoyed programming, which is why I chose to uh, come into Northwestern as a CS major. Um, and I think through taking CS classes, I realized, yeah, this is what I want to do. I really enjoy programming and want to do more of it. And then kind of sophomore, junior year, I also realized I was really interested in like actually like developing algorithms and understanding algorithms, which is why I also picked up the math major because I just felt like that complemented it well. Um, but even though I am, like there is a lot of theory in CS, which, but I think um, even though there's so much theory, there's a lot of ways you can apply that theory, which is why I like, really like CS a lot more. Uh, myself, I also have kind of 
more unorthodox, um, similar to uh, similar. Uh, I was interested in like building things uh, when I was little, puzzles, models, stuff like that. Um, I wasn't, there wasn't robotics club in middle school. There was a robotics club in high school, but I actually only ended up joining with Lego robotics because I thought I might be interested in uh, that kind of stuff. And it turned out I was, I'm glad I did because once I hit Northwestern, I figured out that there was a different robotics club and major specific, the Lego Robotics Club actually helped me realize I was interested in the engineering side of stuff, along with the medical side of things. I wanted to be a doctor when I was little, but when I realized there was more to the medical field than being a surgeon, I chose to pursue biomedical engineering. And I like the, I like going towards things related to like prosthetics or bioelectronics, where it's applying engineering, but you also have to have knowledge of biology and chemistry and stuff like that. And I'm not switching to mechanical like so many other people. Yeah, that's a pretty common thing actually is to go from PME to like Mickey or something. Also, another big thing is I know that you guys are applying to college and you know some colleges do sort of make you take an intended major when you're applying. But um, you know, your experience will vary, but like in talking to a lot of friends, you're not necessarily Hold to that super tightly you know one of the things that's great about northwestern at least is that it's super easy to change um even some of the other schools that say that they're a little more limiting in terms of how easy it is to switch majors um you know you're never totally locked in to your major um so you know i would say if you're trying to choose a major just sort of read through the courses that the major does sort of you know see if the classes seem interesting um sort of maybe look at what people with the degrees do um and pick that way, but just sort of remember that it's not, you know, the be all end all, right? If you choose to be a, you know, mechanical engineer coming into college, it doesn't mean that you're going to graduate with that degree or same with biomed, computer engineering, CS, whatever. So I wouldn't stress out about that too much as you're applying, um, just sort of figure out what's interesting for you. Yeah, I would also say, like, I think just a general good idea is it's okay to come in to college thinking you have a plan, but definitely be willing to be flexible about that plan because I think there's so much in college that you don't get to experience when you're in high school. And, and I think a lot of those experiences are gonna shape what you wanna study. Uh, so just keep an open mind when you go into college. Um, yeah. Oh, I was wondering um, <clears throat> like about the club, how do you guys like advertise that? Like, right. I don't know. Advertising the club? Yeah. Go ahead, Jackson. <laughs> well, for one of our biggest recruiting tactics is actually Instagram. Uh, we have an Instagram that you all should go follow, uh, and your rebuttals on Instagram. I don't, I don't run it, but it's become a running joke. No, I um, plant that question. I swear that was not a plan. Yeah. <laughs> no, and your robotics and Instagram is a big thing for us. Um, we sort of get members to post stuff around. We've gotten a few members that way. We also do uh, engineering uh, club fairs. Northwestern has uh, quarterly club fairs, so there's three throughout the year where we basically set up a booth um, with like, you know, a presentation or whatever, and find members who want to join that way. Uh, we also send out email newsletters um, to the engineering school every now and then, sort of getting people interested. So, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of advertising, but yeah. The best advertising you do is like looking like you're having fun solving cool problems because like most of the people around you in engineering school want to do that too. And so if they see you doing it, they'll be like, oh, can I join? Yeah, that's a big thing. For sure. Yeah, there's two new questions. Yeah, there's two new questions. Uh, Anything recommended for the college process? That's a loaded question for going to. <laughs> it's also a bit far away for me. Um, uh, see, that was four years ago. I, okay, I, you know, I don't think there's like a golden ticket for college admissions, mm -hmm. right? Like, it, there's a lot of stuff online where it's like, you should do this, 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 and this, and you'll get into your college, right? Like, do what you find super fun and interesting. If colleges see that, like, you're passionate about stuff, that you have stuff that you enjoy doing, or, I mean, if you don't have stuff like that, stuff that you just like doing and you're passionate about and you're willing to devote time to, um, it's sort of like seeing that. So I'd just say, you know, Try to find something that you find fun, whether it's, you know, a sports team or robotics club, 
programming club, CS, whatever, just find something that you like doing um, and sort of just try to spend as much time as you can doing that. Um, Cause you know, even if it's not, you know, the most, you know, even if it's not something that everyone in engineering does, um, it still can look super good on a, an application. So without going any more specific on that. Um, um, I can add uh, in high school, actually, uh, I only took Lego robotics for one year because my high school experience was mainly following my passion for music. I played both piano and violin. So I just joined a bunch of orchestra related stuff, but being able to connect like my passion and uh, how much I enjoyed the teamwork, the collaboration aspect of that translated into like college essays or just showing that you have passion for something and you want to follow it. I would also suggest that take classes that you want to take. Um, yeah, you might think, oh, if I take as many AP classes as possible, that's going to boost my chances. Um, well, while that may or may not be true, I do think that taking classes more related to what you want to do is more important than having as many AP classes you can. I didn't take AP history because I didn't want to. I focused more on taking like AP bio or chemistry because I was more interested in that kind of thing. Also, if your school doesn't necessarily have the AP classes or whatever, just take you know the classes that are you know, aligned with what you want to do. Um, you like an IB kid like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Sorry. Oh yeah, so for the next question, um, for mechanical engineering, there's sort of like two like holy grail or like capstone classes, um, which are like intro to materials and mechanics of materials. Um, so in, intro to materials or like intro to material science um, just sort of goes through like um, how different materials are classified, like how they work, um, like different ways of um, uh, what's the word? Um, like how they perform mechanically, like how strong they are and stuff like that. And then mechanics and materials is like bending beams, um, uh, moments of inertia, stuff like that. And those two classes adding together um, are sort of um, like, like I said, the capstone of how to do mechanical engineering. So those are two that are really um, beneficial um, for pre-high school classes or pre-college, sorry. Um, <laughs> like Olivia was saying, I would recommend taking AP classes that are uh, related to your major, um, if you can, especially like pre-calc, um, pre-phys, or not pre -calc, yeah, pre-calc, calculus, um, physics, because um, if you do well on the AP test, then you don't have to take them, well, depending on your university, um, but then you don't have to take them in college, um, and that's really helpful because a lot of those classes are like weed-out classes, um, so you'll get out of having to do weed-out classes, um, and then you also sort of get ahead and you can take more classes that you're interested in, so. If you don't come into college with at least sophomore standing, you're like behind. Like, oh my God. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't I'm kidding. listen to it. Of course, <laughs> you don't. All, that's not the um, end all be all on um, the pathway through college. But if you can do that, I would recommend. I would say it's pretty helpful to have at least some programming experience coming into college, because um, usually, even if you don't have like the AP CS credit, you can then test out of the sort of first CS class. Um, so you know. You're going to a case of that, so you've probably done a fair amount of engineering related stuff, so you've probably had some experience with programming, but that is sort of like one of the big things that I'm pretty glad I did in high school. By the way, if you're like planning on going into mechanical engineering and you think to yourself, I don't need to learn programming, that's software, that's not mechanical, you would be wrong. Um, programming is really useful for any engineering degree. Um, it'll help you do math, it'll help you um, do a whole bunch of stuff. So. Anyone, if no matter what you're doing, having programming experience is good. Um, could you guys talk about a little more about the academic rigor of an engineering degree? Because from what I've heard, like engineering majors are supposed to be very time intensive. Yeah, that's true. Uh, engineering majors are definitely like, I mean, as an engineering major, I would like that <laughs> the hardest. I think the general consensus on campus between all students is that on average, an engineering degree takes the most amount of time and like most amount of hours to get um except for maybe a couple in like the college arts and sciences um my experience was like kind of has garrett allude to 
freshman year when your classes are largest and there's the most people taking them and everybody's kind of like coming in not knowing much and everybody's like still like super amped from high school and like wants to work really hard it's like kind of cutthroat but that kind of dies out a little bit i found that my classes have gotten a lot more like friendly to me time friendly as you know college has gone on professors become a little bit more chill most of the time professors teaching intro classes don't want to be teaching intro classes so they yeah. just do whatever so i don't know i think like even if you have a hard time freshman year in an engineering major that does that's not super indicative of what the rest of college is going to be like it it, it does not get harder at least for me it didn't i don't think anybody would say that it, it got a, yeah. a lot harder for them after freshman year um yeah they're like they're I don't know. You kind of you kind of find a rhythm after a while. You like figure out what most cl most classes want across majors. It's like you know you do a homework assignment like once per week for that class. Have a couple exams. You know maybe a final project or something. And it's like I don't know. It's, it doesn't get too complicated after that. Yeah. Thank you. If you could go back and give uh, your high school self one piece of advice, what do you think that would be? <laughs> I probably would have told myself to relax a bit. I think I like looking back on my high school experience, I feel like I kind of I I guess first of all, I went to a very structured high school where there were a lot of classes that we were all required to take. So I I just because of that, I did end up like overloading on a lot of AP classes. I kind of wish I didn't do that um because I realized a lot of it wasn't that useful when I came to college and I probably didn't need to have done all that. Um to be a Northwestern and like, I guess not just classes. I think I put a lot of time into my extracurriculars as well. And like at a certain, there was a point in high school where I didn't feel like I had a life outside of school. So um, yeah, I would have told myself to just relax a bit and enjoy, enjoy your time. Enjoy high school. <laughs> just enjoy <laughs> it. Like enjoy, enjoy college too. Like don't be like killing yourself. Yeah. 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 That's basically what I would have said, yeah. <laughs> Oh, time commitment to robotics. Um, so that's like a, a thing where, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, but um, like some other clubs on campus are really big about like time commitment and you have to come to meetings um, and you have to do this. And But here at uh, North uh, at Robotics, we um, try to just like make sure everyone's having a good time, making sure everyone's surviving classes. So we really don't have like a set time limit. Um, you come when you can, when you want to. Um, yeah. Yeah, it definitely varies. Like we have some members like Sam probably <laughs> spend oh, a lot of hours in a week. 20 to 40 probably. It's 20 yeah. to 40 hours. But then like I, I spend probably like maybe five, six, seven hours a week on it. We have some members that, you know, they come to the meetings, maybe they'll work on a little bit of cat outside the meeting, but they really only spend, you know, one, two hours a week on it. So it really does vary. Uh, by members so at least northwestern it is kind of what you make of it no, it definitely depends on clubs like there are some clubs where there's an expected time commitment of like 10 hours 15 20 hours a week um and so depending on what university you go to and what clubs you choose to join and the culture yeah. and the clubs and the culture exactly like your experience will vary but for us at least it's pretty much the time you put into it is kind of whatever you want so yeah. don't let people force you to spend time doing something that you don't want to do like i spend that much time because i really like doing robotics and i like doing stuff for the club and i probably wouldn't rather be doing anything else so like yeah don't that'll be that'll be true for no matter what even if you're like not an engineer like yeah don't let the theater club force you to practice for 18 hours a day <laughs> if you don't want to also there's a bit of advice which is if you have a club or an activity or something that you find yourself like procrastinating on other work to do this is sort of one of the things that made me realize that I wanted to do like computer engineering and computer science in college. If you find yourself like spending a lot more time on some assignments or, you know, some like club work to avoid working on other homework that you don't like doing as much, that might be a sign that, you know, you might want to major in something in that area. Um, <laughs> right. Like if you're spending 20 hours a week doing CAD work and you're not liking, you know, bio as much, that might be a sign <laughs> that you might maybe you should do mechanical engineering instead of biomed. So, you know. Yeah. 
extracurriculars. Um, you can talk about those. Sure. Well, yeah, like it just sort of depends what's available to you. Um, but of course, robotics, that's what I've always been involved in. Um, yeah, the big thing is what, what, what do you have? Like, um, there's car teams you could join. Um, like you said, software is good for mechanical engineers as well. Um, and of course you could just sort of come up with your own thing, design your own things. Like I, I think um, owning a 3D printer is a really cool hobby for a mechanical engineer, especially one you have to construct yourself. Um, as you build a kit, you get skills doing that. And then you learn um, CAD and um, design um, as well as like how to actually use the 3D printer. Um, so that's something like if you don't have many extracurriculars around you and you want to get involved in something, I think getting like a cheap 3D printer is a really cool idea. Um, I know someone in high school who who's majoring in mechanical engineering now, but they were actually part of um, theater and like the prop building department, and mm -hmm. they were part of that. Because kind of, they just really like being hands on and building the actual stuff. Okay, I guess we'll wait and see if we have uh, any more questions. Um, but other than that, I think we may wrap up. Thank you all so much for your time uh, and your expertise, uh, as well as advice. And, and um, if we don't have any more questions, uh, I think good luck to everyone uh, in school. And um, uh, thank you so much. I was, I was just wondering, like, one last one, I guess, for, like, it's like a, I don't know how fast it is. And I think you guys might, I don't know if you talked about this one. I might have missed it, but all right. How? But like, you know, when you're like, you said you guys built like a lacrosse robot, and like, I was just wondering like how you guys got that to work. Like, just like simply, it's probably complicated, but you know, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> That's a good question. Well, it doesn't work yet. So yeah. It'll still work. Oh, you guys are working, but like, what are you guys like planning? On? Like, what are you guys like planning to, you know? So this is the general design kit. Go ahead, Sam. All yeah, right. So um, essentially, it kind of works by moving around the end effector. We use a set of belts set up where you can spin a motor and it pulls on a belt. And then it kind of like, oh, man, how do I discuss this? That, that's OK. Garrett's grabbing one of the motors. It's kind of beefy. Yeah, here's our motor that we're, well, we have two of these motors. Um, you can see it in the upper right hand corner of the CAD model. This is the mount, so you can sort of get an idea for scale. Um, they're very big motors, a lot of a lot of torque. So, yeah. Yeah. So, like, you need to move around an end effector in two degrees of freedom. That means you need two motors to drive two degrees of freedom, like x and y position, in order to create all the vectors of movement you need to create there. Um, and so we kind of use one long belt wrapped around some pulleys around the whole thing to pull it around. It, if you're curious about it, you can look up like a, a Core XY 3D printer or an, an H, H bot type of configuration. I won't, I won't try and explain that. Um, and yeah, so it just kind of moves, it pulls this end effector around to try and catch it. Uh, that's kind of like the basis of the, the, of the mechanics right there. I think we have like some like photos and like there's a video right on our website. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Probably pretty old. Yeah, we have some old. older photos of our design process on the website if you want to check that out. Um, I think it was with the bio that was listed anywhere. But... Yeah, do you have any more questions about that? So that was my grade F explanation. Um, no, I don't think so. Good. So I think we'll wrap the event up. Uh, thank, every, thank you everyone for coming and thank you so much to the robotics team for taking the time out of your day to speak for us. Yeah, we could help out. So have a good day.